Hello and welcome to lecture 19 part 1. Here we're going to cover a bunch of new developments. Uh, we are going to continue with the Hamiltonian approach, conservation laws, and canonical transformations. So before I get to that, I wanted to remind you a few about a few organizational things. Uh, please do not forget to rate this course on CTAC. Your feedback is extremely important to me and to the university as a whole so that I can improve the quality of this course for the future. It would be extremely important for me to know whether this new format has been working out well or not and what can be improved. So I would really appreciate you uh, being able to spend a few minutes of your time and fill out those CTACs for the course. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, out of the way, let us now get back to the uh, exciting uh, Hamiltonian approach. Last time, we have derived the canonical equations of motion, and these equations uh, took this really nice symmetric form. Before we get to the equations, though, let us remind ourselves what is the form of the Hamiltonian itself. So the Hamiltonian is the sum over all of the degrees of freedom i of pi conjugate momentum corresponding to the ith degrees of degree of freedom times the uh, velocity uh, q dot i minus the Lagrangian. And, uh, and when cast in terms of the Hamiltonian, the equations of motion uh, take on a really nice and symmetric form. So these are known as the canonical equations. And uh, as you see, they do have a lot of symmetry. The only difference uh, between the two equations of motion uh, for qi and for pi is the presence of the sign in the second equation. Uh, here, q and p are known as the canonical variables. And we wrapped up yes, last time's lecture uh, by describing the algorithm by which we can construct the Hamiltonian and uh, write down and solve the canonical equations. Uh, today, we're going to start with a new topic related to uh, this approach, namely conservation laws uh, that uh, follow from uh, the Hamiltonian approach. So let us... Uh, uh, armed with be <laughs> armed with this definition, let us uh, compute the time derivative of Hamiltonian. So our Hamiltonian is a function of q, p, and t. And if we write down dh dt, uh, we can uh, use uh, the chain rule. And here, because dh dq is equal to minus p dot, dh dq is equal to minus p dot, and dh dp is equal to q dot, you can see that these two terms cancel each other out, and uh, we are left with just one term, dh, dt partial derivative. This means that if the Hamiltonian is independent of time, it is conserved. Now suppose that uh, h is independent of one of the variables. Uh, suppose that, for instance, uh, in a two-dimensional case, uh, if h has this form, and suppose that it is a cyclic in the q2 variable. So it doesn't depend on q2. In this case, uh, we can write down the equation of motion for the conjugate momentum, and uh, uh, find that it is going to be conserved. 
because H does not depend on Q2. Uh, so from here, P2 is conserved. So what we have just done, we have gotten rid of an entire degree of freedom. Because the momentum associated with that degree of freedom is just a simple constant. So that degree of freedom has just been eliminated. We have done something like this. Uh, for the uh, effective potential of orbital motion. So there is a big question uh, that might be on your mind. What is H? Um, is it energy? Is it conserved? And the answer is yes, sometimes it's energy and sometimes it is conserved. However, Sometimes H can be energy and will not be conserved, and sometimes it can be conserved but will not quite be energy. So let us take a look uh, at an example to try and uh, get a better sense of how this all works out. I'm going to get to that in section 2 of our lecture 19. See you there. Hi, this is part 2 of lecture 19. And as promised, we're now going to take a look at a few practical examples of how to um, get a better sense of what energy conservation uh, really means. So let us consider a simple case of uh, a cart with uh, an oscillator uh, loaded on it. And this cart is moving uh, at the speed VC, which is a constant. So uh, how are we going to try and figure out what are the conserved quantities here? Well, first of all, uh, let's try and write down what Lagrangian is. Well, Lagrangian uh, can be written out quite easily. Uh, we can just say that it is m over 2 times x dot squared uh, minus 1 half uh, k uh, x, the x coordinate of the mass, minus the coordinate of the car times, uh, which is vc, the velocity of the car times t, all squared. And uh, from here we can write down that the momentum is equal to uh, dl dx dot or mx dot. Uh, and from here we can write down the equations of motion uh, mx double dot. Uh, is equal to minus k x minus v c uh, t uh, by the Euler Lagrange equations. And uh, from here we can write down uh, the equations of motion uh, introducing uh, the uh, relative coordinate uh, to the cart x minus v c times t. Uh, that will give us x double dot is equal to minus kx, um, um, x double dot prime is equal to minus kx prime. So this is the regular uh, equations of motion for the oscillator. Of course, it doesn't matter that our oscillator is sitting on the card. Uh, the, the fact that uh, we have jumped into uh, an inertial frame moving together with the card doesn't really change the physics of the oscillator. Of course, this is uh, to be expected. However, let's try and compute the energy associated uh, with this motion. So if we, if we were to do that, uh, we would get uh, the following. So the Hamiltonian here, uh, which is given by the regular expression px dot minus l, uh, is uh, energy, right? Uh, but it is not conserved. where by energy I mean energy in the regular sense, which is kinetic plus uh, potential energy. And it is not conserved because it has an explicit dependence on time. So what can we do? Let us try and switch variables in the Lagrangian to uh, express everything relative to the card. 
So what we've done here, uh, we have gone from x to x prime, uh, which is the coordinate relative to the card, and uh, similarly from x dot to x dot prime, velocity relative to the card. And in both cases, we simply subtracted the coordinate of the card from the coordinate of the mass, or the velocity of the card from the velocity of the mass. Uh, and the Lagrangian in these new coordinates uh, looks uh, like this, where we've expressed x in terms of x prime, uh, or x dot in terms of x prime dot, and uh, um, we've expressed x in terms of x prime and the potential energy. So from here, we can compute momentum prime p prime in the new coordinates, and that is m times x dot prime plus vc. That allows us to compute uh, the velocity in the new coordinates, x dot prime, uh, in terms of the momentum. So when we compute the Hamiltonian using the regular approach, uh, we are going to find that it reduces to something that is conserved. It's not dependent on time, therefore Hamiltonian is conserved, but it is not energy. Uh, this is energy with respect to the card. Hopefully this was useful to get a better sense for uh, the physical meaning of the Hamiltonian and uh, energy conservation. And in the next part, we're going to upgrade our consideration to the Hamilton's principle and canonical transformations. I'm going to see you in part three with a lot of exciting new stuff to come. Hello and welcome to part three of our amazing lecture 19. We will look at the Hamilton's principle and canonical transformations all in one go. So let's recall uh, the principle of least action or the Hamilton's principle. The variation of action, which is the integral from t1 to t2, from the beginning point to the ending point of our path uh, of the Lagrangian over time, is going to be zero. That is, our path is critical uh, in terms of action. It either minimizes action, maximizes action, or is uh, a, another critical point, like an inflection point uh, in our um, action integral. And from here, from here, and so from here, uh, we can uh, get the Euler-Lagrange equations that d dt of dl dq is equal to dl dq. Now let us write down exactly the same uh, principle, but expressed in terms of the Hamiltonian. So this. Uh, is uh, oftentimes referred to as the modified Hamiltonian's principle. Let us treat q and p as independent variables and see if we can somehow manage to tease out uh, the canonical equations from this modified Hamilton's principle. So what do we do in this case usually? We take the variation inside of the integral uh, and make it operate on the integrand uh, and treat it basically just like any other differential. So what do we get? So what have we got here? Uh, we took delta and um, uh, let it operate on p q dot. So first it operates on the first of these two terms and we get delta p times q dot. Then it operates on the second term. So we would get p delta q dot. But because delta and dot can be changed in order, we can also write it out as p uh, d dt of delta q. Uh, finally, uh, we can apply delta the variation to h keeping in mind that it depends on two independent variables, q and p. So the variation of h, full variation of h, we can write it out uh, using a chain rule. So delta h will be dh dq times delta q uh, plus dh dp times delta p. And of course, both of them come in with a minus sign because h itself came in with a minus sign. So this is uh, how the modified Hamilton's principle looks like. 
And uh, now we want to uh, remember uh, that we can write this down as uh, d dt of p delta q minus delta q times p dot. So what we've done, uh, we've basically formed a full time derivative and subtracted the extra bit that we had to throw in uh, when we formed uh, this uh, full time derivative. As you may remember, uh, the full time derivative uh, will not affect uh, the result because uh, it will integrate out and result in uh, uh, the differences uh, of p dq between the beginning and the end of our integral. And remember that the variation vanishes at the beginning and the ending points. So uh, this term will not contribute uh, to the integral. And so what we are ending up with uh, are uh, the terms containing delta q Uh, two of them, and the terms containing delta p, also two of them. In order for the integral to be equal to zero uh, for all of the variations, uh, we need to demand that the terms in the integrand multiplying delta q and delta p have to be identically zero. And so from here, we can get that uh, we, we are getting our canonical equations because the factors uh, in front of delta p are q dot minus dh dp. Uh, so that gives us the first of the canonical equations and the factors in front of delta q uh, give us um, minus dh dq minus uh, uh, p dot, which means that we are getting p dot equal to minus dh dq. So we do get the canonical equations uh, from the modified Hamilton's principle. And so how are we going to make use of that? It turns out that this uh, variational approach is extremely useful to uh, go and derive the concept of canonical transformations. And you can read more on the canonical transformations in chapter nine in Goldstein. Canonical transformations are very simple at their core. This is just a change of variables. But they are, or they can be, extremely powerful. So how does it look? Uh, let's give an example and then we're going to move on to the next section of this lecture because I'm running out of the board space. Suppose that we're dealing with a two-dimensional system with two degrees of freedom. So our Hamiltonian depends on q1, p1, q2, p2, and time. Actually, I scraped that. No time. Suppose that it only depends on the coordinates and the momentum. So let us now change from little q's and p's to big capital q's and p's. And suppose that we have chosen this transformation, the new variables, in such a way uh, that our new Hamiltonian, uh, which will uh, receive a prime over here, is actually cyclic in both q1 and q2. If this is indeed the case, the problem is completely solved uh, because um, both P1 and P2 are going to be conserved quantities plus the energy is a conserved quantity. So we are totally, totally done uh, with this problem. So let us uh, consider an example of how this can work uh, in uh, the next section, 19.4. I'm going to see you there in just a moment. Hello and welcome to lecture 19.4 where we continue to look at the amazing canonical transformations. And right here, right there, we just have realized that if we are able to switch to new coordinates, the capital Q's and P's, then if the new Hamiltonian in these coordinates uh, doesn't depend on Q's, 
then we have completely solved the system. That's the idea behind the canonical transformations. And let us see how it can work in practice. Uh, for instance, suppose that uh, we have QI variable that is cyclic. And from here, we're going to get that PI is going to be a constant because its time derivative is zero. Uh, conversely, for QI, we're going to find that it is equal to uh, some um, function that we will call omega i that depends only on P1 and P2, only on momenta. And because those momenta are both constant, we assume that h prime doesn't depend on any of the uh, coordinates. It means that omega i has no choice than to be a constant itself, which means that q i dot is a constant. Or from here, we can write out that q i is equal to omega i t uh, plus a constant. This is a completely new way of solving equations. So far, we've only transformed the coordinates. Uh, now, let us try and see if we can transform both the coordinates and momenta. So, until now, we have worked with what is referred to as point transformations, where the new coordinates were functions of old coordinates and time. Now we can generalize this transformation and uh, give new coordinates and new momenta in terms of the old coordinates, old momenta and time. However, there is a little bit of bad news. Not all of such transformations uh, work well. And uh, in order to, uh, for the transformation to actually work well, we must have uh, it satisfy some constraints. So in fact, we must have the new coordinates and the new momenta satisfy uh, Hamiltonian's equations, but not for the original Hamiltonian H, but for a different um, function that we will call K, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the Hamiltonian. And this would be a canonical transformation. That is, if such a function exists uh, in the new coordinates Q and P, then uh, the transformation that we use to get to these new coordinates is a canonical transformation. So can we somehow formalize this requirement for the transformation to be canonical? If we have our original Hamiltonian system whose equations of motion can come out from the variational principle or from the Hamilton's principle, modified Hamilton's principle, that looks like that, we must have the same be true for our new coordinates and the Hamiltonian. This is going to tell us whether our uh, transformation is canonical. Namely, if this is true, then our transformation is canonical. In order for both be true, the integrands must be equal. So the integrand over here is equal to the integrand over there, but there is actually another degree of freedom. Uh, there can be a scaling transformation where one will be a constant factor times the other. So uh, we can also multiply uh, one of these by a, a number, which uh, we will denote as lambda. Um, we can also very quickly forget about lambda and set it to one because uh, this is a trivial scaling transformation. And so it doesn't really change the physics of the system. But there is another degree of freedom and that is we can add uh, any function that is a full time derivative. Because in both cases, uh, if we integrate it up, we're going to get the difference of this function at the ends, which will be the same because variation doesn't touch the ends. 
and we're going to call this function f1. We're going to see what conclusions we can derive from this on the next part, five of this lecture. I can't wait to get there with you. See you there in a second. Hello and welcome to part five of lecture 19, where we actually are going to try and get a sense for what this canonical transformation thing really is. I imagine you're dying, dying uh, from curiosity. And I'm going to indulge you in just a moment. Just stay with me, stay with me for just a little bit longer. We're almost there. Okay, so right here, what we found is that in order for our system to satisfy canonical equations of motion in both the old and the new coordinates, which is the uh, sufficient and necessary condition for our transformation to be canonical, uh, that uh, requires uh, that the following is true. So what we've done, we have simply multiplied that relation by dt. And uh, we have uh, been able to get rid of all the derivatives in favor of the differentials. And now uh, let us um, suppose that f1 is a function of some variables. So which variables is it a function of? See, it has a bunch of, di uh, a bunch of uh, differentials. So it's a function of qi, uh, little and qi big and also uh, of uh, the time. And uh, if we write it out this way, we can also write out what df1 is. And df1 will be df dqi times dqi plus df 1 d big qi times delta qi plus df1 dt uh, times uh, dt. And now all we need to do is to collect the prefactors in front of dqi uh, little, dqi big, and dt. And we're going to get our equations of motion. So for dqi little, uh, we're going to find it right here and uh, right there. So what we have is that pi is equal to df1 dqi. Okay, so what about the capital qi? So here we have that uh, capital pi is equal to minus df1 dqi because both of them are added on the same side and there is a zero on the other one. And finally, uh, we also have the time. So here, uh, we're going to get that Hamiltonian is equal to the Hamiltonian uh, plus uh, d f uh, d t. So if we want to write, uh, if we want to use this for solving for our uh, system, what we do is uh, we get an expression of pi in terms of little q's, big q's, and t's. And uh, we're going to invert this uh, for capital QI uh, as a function of little q's, little p's, and t's. Then we're going to substitute this over uh, to here and uh, obtain as a result capital PI, the new momenta, in terms of the little q's, little p's, and the time. And this is the algorithm uh, for solving uh, our system uh, using the canonical approach. F1 is known as a generating function it actually generates the canonical transformation. Here, a few important notes. The note 
here is that the transformation is independent of the Hamiltonian for a given f1 because f1 is all that's needed to define a transformation from the old to the new coordinates. However, we choose the expression for f1, the function f1, the generating function, in order to simplify the Hamiltonian. And of course, any f1 uh, will generate canonical transformation, but we would like to choose the good f1, the one that will simplify the Hamiltonian. It turns out that there is a bunch of different generating functions. This is generating function of type one. There are three more different flavors of canonical transformation. And now we're going to uh, move from F1 to F2 to the most popular or vanilla flavor of canonical transformations. So what we can do is we can switch from f1 to a new function, f2. Uh, by rearranging the differentials. So for instance, we can uh, go from pi dqi to uh, d of pi qi, which means that we have added an extra term, which we can now subtract to keep the quality. And uh, now uh, we can absorb the differential of f1 into uh, the differential of piqi, uh, giving us the new generating function, f2. This gives us the most popular or vanilla canonical transformation. By collecting the terms, now we can express uh, the coordinates in terms of uh, the derivatives of f2, just like we did for f1. So this is the vanilla flavor of transformations, and we have obtained all of these relations just like before by collecting the terms in front of dq little i, uh, d uh, p capital I, and uh, dt. Uh, and uh, we can also write out the original and the two other flavors uh, just here for comparison. I'm going to take this one out uh, just so I can make space. So this is the transformation of type one, where I just copied this over here uh, for completeness. So here are all the four different flavors with the most popular uh, canonical transformation that we're going to be focusing on most of the time in the rest of this course, uh, given by F2. And the two more flavors are given by F3 and F4, uh, looking somewhat different. And you can check them out uh, for yourself. That does it for us tonight with lecture 19. We're going to now move to lecture 20, where we're going to consider a few examples of canonical transformations and are going to start uh, discussing the symplectic canonical transformations. I'm going to see you there. Bye.